Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I expected today was going to be a light uh, from the messages I got. Um, so thank you all who are here. I know that a couple more Stephanie told me, promised me were coming. Uh, but they're running a little late, apparently. Um, we did have 21 though down at the beach this morning. It was very nice. Um, good attendance, good listening. Uh, it's a tough message today. It's the cost of discipleship, and it's uh, part of it is dealing with rejection. I I don't think any of us likes sharing our faith, sharing our frustration with things that go on, and then people just walking away without caring. And that's basically Jesus trying to teach us how to deal with that and what to expect. There they are. Good morning. Oh, thank you. And Carmen is featured in my sermon today, so you need to be good so you can hear me talk about you, okay? It's right in the beginning of my sermon. Um, let's see. Other than that, this is probably my busiest three weeks of the year, uh, right here in the summer. And that I, uh, we have our summer camp program coming up. And I'll be speaking on the topic of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe at the Junior Camp. And uh, so I'm planning to put together a, uh, the stuff for the week for that, the activities, uh, not activities. I, I get all the activities this year, but I get to plan um, the messages and the nice booklet based on the messages. So keep me prepared for that, and I'll be putting together other stuff as we get ready. Um, um, I would ask your prayers and safety for us as we travel because I know one week we leave in two weeks. Two weeks from today we'll be leaving right after church, driving to Scranton, and we'll be driving back on Saturday night. So, me, Stephanie, Nick, and Dave. Right? Alright, so, please keep us in your prayers. Other than that, is there anything else? In our worship at the singing of hymn number 71.
Rejoice and be glad. Let us confess our sins before Almighty God, saying, Almighty and most merciful God, you have heard and strayed from your ways like blood stream. We have fallen too much to the vices and the trials of our own friends. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. We have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no help. But you, O Lord, have heard your response to the miserable things. So are those who have not even confessed their faults. We so are those who are penitent, according to the promises declared unto mankind. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for the name of the merciful Father, for his sake, we may hereafter have a godly, righteous, and sober life, in the glory of our holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of His Holy Spirit. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. We want us to stay on our daily bread, and if we give us our trespasses, do you forgive those who trespass against us? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For I is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, and the glory. Amen. Our, let us sing together the reason that I'm called page two in your first book. Tell your power. Make known the 
children of man your mighty deeds and, and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Against his father and he daughter against her mother. 
and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemy will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take this cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This is the word of the Lord. And now may we all stand and sing the Jubilate Day. He shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy, Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in life by the Lord, strength and always you. Amen. Good morning, or good morning to those watching us now. Marisol might be watching us. She has COVID. I forgot to say this. And at the beginning, we were talking about it before the service started, but I didn't say it online. So please keep Marisol in prayer. Also, she has prepared for her two sisters, Doris and Maria, who are both having issues with cancer. They're both on our prayer list, and I'd ask you to please keep up with them in your prayers. Now, in saying that, it's a nice way to begin my sermon because. It's a picture of the fact that we are limited as humans. We all have failings. Uh, the Romans lesson we had this morning, I didn't have that down on the beach. It's one of my favorite uh, lessons all about the groanings that we have in this world as we look forward to the next world. And this morning, we're dealing with something very similar in Jesus' words, a different type of groaning. The groaning in trying to share the gospel with people, share truth with people, and people just not being at all interested in hearing God, hearing the truth. And honestly, because they're human beings, the frustration it brings to us. And there's no one who's not bothered and frustrated, even if you're not sharing the gospel, when it comes to when you're talking about something and it seems so obvious to us and somebody just doesn't get it when the truth is right there before their eyes. Um, this is actually one of the reasons why I got into the ministry. I went to college at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. I was a biology major. I was taking a class in evolution. And 
all through bi biology classes. Uh, it was led by men who were committed atheists. And especially in biology, this atheistic uh, evolution teacher was trying to explain natural selection, but it became more obvious. The more he taught, the more obvious it was that what he was teaching was impossible. Uh, the eyes are a great example. This, your eyes. I'm going to give you two quick examples. If you want me to go more in depth or you don't understand it, we can talk later. But if you were to, and I, I give this example about the beach, if you were to find a camera in the sand, and you were to look at it and examine it, uh, there's no way you would say that camera just evolved there. That that camera was there because some sand got heated by the sun and some wind blew some leather strap or a cow, you know, kind of decayed in such a way that it made a leather strap and that leather strap formed around, you know, and, and that could go on like this with the most ridiculous explanation of how that camera could have naturally gotten there. You say, no, obviously somebody left it there, right? Intelligent design. And you take the eyeball and consider how much more complicated your eyeball is than a camera. How many more things your eye can do? How much quicker it acts than a camera? But they say, oh, no, that's not intelligent design. The camera is, your eye isn't. And that's just one part of your whole body. Uh, the other thing that got me in evolutionary science is just how the eye exists. Something people don't realize, and they, they swallow with evolution, is that all animals, pretty much, yeah, there's a couple of exceptions, but with a couple of exceptions, all animals have eyes. But what they don't tell you is, according to the evolutionary theory, the branches within the animal kingdom started and branched off before the eyes evolved. That means, according to the evolutionary theory, the eye had to evolve independently and yet identically in at least three different branches. So that means somehow the exact same thing, the eyeball, just randomly evolved in three different branches within the animal kingdom. Somehow. How does that happen? Without intelligent design. So I say, Obviously, look, this is proof. Proof is right in front of your eyes. No, people just, when they, when they don't want to believe, they're going to come up with a reason not to believe. That's why it's toxic for, for me. Um, and I have to swear off listening to talk radio for the longest time. I used to love listening to talk radio and political talk shows. And it just ended up getting me so frustrated and yelling at the radio that I just had to stop. And then I have to be careful when on the computer today, or I'll read something. And what do I do as soon as I read something that really gets on my nerves? I call my wife, and I start complaining to her, can you believe what this person said? And to be honest, I, I will be honest, you do the same thing to me every once in a while, sweet, uh, with something that you hear about a certain court case uh, that you want to share with me, and you can't believe that this person said this. We do that. Because you see, this is obvious truth. Can't you see the truth? and people don't want to see it. Carter, this is where you get to be the main event. I will listen to Carter with tears in his eyes explain why something like, we need to go to the playground. Now, we can't wait 15 minutes to go to the playground. And he can express this. Carter, you can express with enthusiasm, can't you? You can tell me with a pure heart why we have to go to the playground right now. We can't wait 20 minutes. We can't wait a half hour, can we? No. We can't wait for Noah to put on clothes, can we? No. Noah needs to go in his diaper. We need to go to the playground now. Tears. Passion. And it's just natural that when people don't understand what we're trying to say, you know, the world is wrong, right? And that's, that's part of why, when it comes to something like what we're going to talk about today, sharing the gospel, what level of magnitude is it? 
when we're sharing not, can I go to the playground, but this is the gospel. This is the most important thing you can consider. And when we're shot down, when we're sharing our faith personally, it hurts even so much more, which is why Christians will tend to get quiet. Because they, they don't want to have to face being shut up. You, you see the magnitude of the sins that have corrupted our society. We know the importance of the cross. And yet, we get marginalized and we just feel we need to be quiet. And what's even worse, I think, are those in society who will tell you something along these lines. And, and I, I, I read this uh, big uh, hubbub about one particular book publication society, which used to be a Christian book publication society named Urban's, which is no longer a Christian book publication society. It's just a book publication society. And a lot of people are arguing about that. But, but the issue is, someone will say something along the lines of, I believe in a God of love. Nothing is more important than just loving one another. And why can't we just all love one another? And the question I need to ask and to address you is this. If someone is drowning down below me, and I say to them, I love you and I accept you just the way you are, and I leave them alone, is that love? Or is love taking <laughs> a life saver, a life preserver, and tossing it down to them so that they would be able to live? And what our world is telling us is that when we offer them life, we're not offering them love. And that's been kind of the case for quite a while now. And that's why it's so important we look at lessons like today, where Jesus tells us, expect that when you share your faith, they're not going to listen to you. Um, it should not be a great surprise to us that no matter how clearly or excellently we think we explain things, because honestly we're faulty, simple people, and that's kind of what Paul is trying to get, people just aren't going to get it. And it's not really us. It's really the sin in their life. It doesn't matter how compassionate we are. It doesn't matter how how firm our conviction is. You can ask Carter. It doesn't matter how firm Carter's conviction is. Uh, people, that's not going to take him to the playground if he's screaming and yelling. That's just the way it is. So with all this said, I don't have a great, perfect message of this is the way you win unbelievers. That's not what Jesus is offering this morning. He's offering what could be considered a tough teaching, or it could be considered a comforting teaching. Matthew 10, 24 and 25. <clears throat> a disciple is not above his master, nor a servant above, sorry, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple to be like his teacher, and a servant like his master. It's a very easy, yet I think painful summary of the burden of the cross that we carry as disciples. Consider, if Jesus came proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming repent, Turn to the Lord and receive salvation. And they hated him. And they killed him. And that's Jesus. Why do we think we would have it so much easier? And that's basically what Jesus is saying. When he says it's enough for disciples to be like his teacher, uh, some people confuse that. They think it's talking about some sort of, uh, I've seen, Christian perfectionism. And you might get that if you take it completely out of context without looking at, you know, the whole rest of the chapter. But that's not what it's talking about. And there might be other cases you could talk about some sort of Christian perfectionism, but not here. This is saying 
Jesus is calling us to be content with the job we have been given. What is the job we are given? To be faithful in sharing our faith with others, just like he was faithful in preaching the gospel, and to realize that if, if the Holy Spirit doesn't bring it to fruit, that that doesn't mean that we didn't do what we were supposed to do. We are planters. It's kind of like in the parable of the sower and the seed. Our job is to scatter seed. Our job is to share the gospel with those who we meet. It's the Holy Spirit's job to bring that word to fruition. Our section of Matthew 10 is part of Jesus' larger teaching in terms of his missionary discourse to his disciples. And it's all about facing, being committed when we know we're going to have to go into conflict, when we know we're going into situations where there will be suffering. Right before our lesson, Jesus says this in verses 21 and 22, and this is probably pretty famous, you probably heard this before. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and the child will rise up against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all for my sake. Now, you say, well, that's not very encouraging. Uh, well, the point Jesus is trying to get us to recognize this is. When we tell the world they're sinning, they're not going to jump up and down with enthusiasm. That's why he says, he came not to bring peace, but a sword. We did read that in our section. When we follow him, we should expect conflict. We should expect conflict in our family that some people are just going to reject him. Jesus says, we have to therefore be ready. Know your loyalty. Who comes first in your life? Because if he doesn't come first in your life, he'll never be able to minister to your family in the proper way. Being a disciple of Jesus is not an invitation, first and foremost, to join happiness in this world. There's lots of churches where you'll hear people preaching that kind of nonsense, but that's not what Jesus is saying at all. Now, there are times of joy, obviously, in this world. So you can't say you'll never find joy. But the call is first and foremost to joy in when? In the next world. It's a call to self-sacrifice. It's a call often for suffering in the face of powerful opposition. Jesus never promised that it was going to be easy for us to be his disciples. Now, other parts of the world have it a lot worse than we do right now. Uh, and we can thank God that we're not as bad as other places like the Middle East or China, but that doesn't mean it's not getting dramatically worse here every day. You hear all sorts of stories um, where Christians, when we're not just going along with society's trends seem to be a complete odds and shunned to the side of society so much so that we become the butts of jokes. And that just simply being a Christian means you're not allowed to speak in certain circumstances. And to make situations even worse, Many people take those simply for believing what they believe and saying what they believe to court for trying to oppose others. There's a, a new thing now with pronouns that's going on, where people can choose whatever pronoun they want. If you don't use their pronouns, you could be brought to court over it. The Bible commands us to stand for truth. And these truths don't always go along with what the world says. A uh, big thing now, transgender rights, and that's kind of what I was alluding to. Uh, things like the, the swimmer for Penn State. There was a guy swimming for Penn State who wanted to win lots of medals, so he swam against the girls and said he was a girl. And what did society say? If you call him a man, you're a bigot. You, you are a, a sexist. Or, or I don't even remember the right term. I'm so behind the times. I'm sorry. 
uh, the right terms that, that they call Christians nowadays. But the Bible commands us to stand for what is right and what is true. And we're going to be told all kinds of things, dinosaurs, all sorts of things, for believing the truth of what God's Word says. In fact, and it gets to the end, Jesus says in John 16, 2, The hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering a service to God. When the world kills us, when the world says, you are worthless, you need to get away, they think they're honoring God by doing it. And society thinks that by shutting up the Christians, by moving society forward and getting away from Christianity, we honor God. That's kind of what I was getting at at the beginning, where people say, God is love without judgment. The more clearly your life shows what the true God expects of people, the more dangerous our lives are going to be. Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.12, Those who desire a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. I don't mean to bring all bad news today, and that's kind of hard, I realize. Um, but the greater our desire to live a godly life, the greater we will be offending people committed to their unbelief and nullity. So, as I said, I don't mean to bring just a downer to everyone this morning. The text does give us some good news out of this. Jesus gives us a couple of things in this passage. One, don't we don't need to fear those who can kill the body. Our bodies are going to die anyway, when you think about it. Everyone will die. We hear on the news every day. Someone famous dying. James Conn died uh, recently. And everyone dies. What you need to fear is who controls your soul. And that's God. So Jesus says, make sure you're right with God first. They might be able to kill our bodies, but only God can control your soul. Those who fear God have no need to fear anything else. The other thing is, is I began. What is our job? Our job is not when we preach, we need to expect that dramatically water is thrown up to the ground. Our job and what Jesus is trying to teach us here is just simply this. When we talk to others, our job is to share who we are in Christ. When we do that, God is glorified. God is pleased with us. It's not the result. It's when we do what he tells us to do. So with that encouragement, disciples of Christ are expected. And as a little picture on your bulletin says, take up their cross. To follow him as we follow all those who have gone before us. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you can strengthen us to follow you. We pray, Lord, that as we are so often troubled, that when we share our faith, others don't seem to want to listen. We pray, Lord, that you can give us the encouragement to. In doing what you ask of us, we have pleased you and followed what you ask us to do. Of course, so importantly, Lord, we pray that as we share our faith, we'll open the hearts of those, especially in our family, who need to hear your gospel. We pray, Lord, for our family members and friends who we have opportunity, that you will open their hearts and their ears. We pray, Lord, for our society and culture that has just stopped its ears for what you have to say. You will awaken and revive the hearts of this nation that they may see who you are. Turn and repent and stop running in terms of this nowhere 
really around. This we thank through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I reflect with him is number six.
that we finally lose not the thing eternal. Grant us, O Heavenly Father, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. O Lord, God of the infinite mercy, we humbly beg you to look down with pity upon the nations now engaged in the war. Look in compassion on those immediately exposed to peril, conflict, sickness, and death. Comfort the prisoners, relieve the suffering of the wounded, and show mercy to the dying. Tenderly regard those who live at home in fear, deprivation, and sorrow. Remove in your good providence all causes and occasions of war, and of your great goodness and sore peace from all the nations. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. O Lord our government is glorious in all the world. We commend this nation to your merciful care, to being guided by your providence and made well secure in your peace. Grant to Joe Biden, the President of the United States. And to all in the authority, wisdom, and strength, and know to do your will. Fill them with the love of truth and righteousness, and make them ever mindful of their calling to serve as people in your fear. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Almighty God, the strong power and refuge of your people, we entreat your favor upon the officers and all who are and have been enlisted in the service and defense of our country. Spare them from being ordered into a war of aggression or oppression. Use them if need be as your instruments in the defense of our national life and liberty. Watch over also all policemen and law enforcement officers everywhere. Protect them from harm in the performance of their duty. We pray also for firefighters, first responders, and healthcare workers. And all who protect us in our small place of danger. Give them the courage and skill to carry out their duties well and safely. When they must go into the face of danger, be by their side. Watch over their families, reminding them that those who go into danger are in your loving care. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, whom comes every good and perfect good, sent down upon our bishops, especially Foley, Ray, and Chuck, Pastor Mike, David Prince, the St. Louis Bishop Boston Church, Jason Pattinson, and St. Mark's Church in Jenkins, and other clergy upon the congregations committed to their charge, the helpful spirit of your grace. And that they may truly please you, pour upon them the continual do of your blessing. This morning we pray especially for the ministry of the Atlantic City Rescue Mission and the Board of Foreign Missions. Especially, also, we pray for the work of the Meyer family in Germany. Grant us, O Lord, for the honor of our advocate and the Lord, Jesus Christ. O God, the creator and preserver of all mankind, we humbly beg you for all sorts and conditions of men, that you would be pleased to make your ways known unto them. You are saving help unto all nations. More especially, we pray for your holy church in the that we be so guided and governed by your good spirit, that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth and all the faith and unity of spirit in the bond of peace and the righteousness of life. Finally, we commend your fatherly goodness all those who are in any ways afflicted or distressed in mind by or state, especially those for whom our prayers are now desired. For Volodymyr Zelensky and the people of the Ukraine, for Jeannie, Tony, Al, Dominic, Doris, Maria, Marisa, Mary McCrony, Destiny, George, Pat, for Larry and Debbie, Rosemary, Margaret, the McQuaid and Catherine Lewis family, Chris Donnell, Sabrina, for Cookie's family with her loss, the Hyde family, the Steph's uncle Mike, Katie, Kenzie, and for Stephanie's continued recovery from her appendectomy. 
that it might please you to comfort and relieve them, according to their sorrow and necessity, giving them patience under their sufferings and a happy issue out of all their affliction. This we thank for Jesus Christ's sake. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we are unworthy servants, we do hard work and very thanks. For all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men, we bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, and the means of grace and for the love of the glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of all your mercy, that our hearts may be truly thankful, and we may declare your praise not only with our lips, but in our minds, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in the holiness and righteousness of our way. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom the view of the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, we promise to give a vision to those who ask in your son's name. Mercifully accept us who have now made our prayers and petitions to you, and grant us those things that you have asked in faith, according to your will, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of all of us, be with us all. Our closing is 295. Almighty the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be upon you in the name of you all.